Hello and welcome to American Dream Latin Souls. I'm Daniel Ortiz and today my guest is entrepreneur Michael Reese. Michael, thank you for, for coming. Hey, thank you for having me here. So Michael, you are the uh, president of Today's Restoration DKI and you're an entrepreneur who's been in business for, for quite a while. So I want to, you to share your story of how you got started because you're based on the background that we talked about, you're a, a typical entrepreneur. And, and what I mean by typical is you've been in some form of business since you were a young kid. Is yes, that right? Exactly. It all started off when I was a young kid, third grade, uh, decided to sell bubble gum at school. And uh, <laughs> selling bubble gum at school, I started to realize the profit. And after I tuned that up, I was making $40 a week in third $40 grade. $40 a week in third grade. Okay. Yes. So you, you got the bug early. Yes, I okay. sure did. Okay. So, um, Tell us about today's restoration DKI. What, what kind of business is that and what is it that you actually do? We're the kind of business that you would think of like an ambulance service. You hope you never have to see us, okay. but if you do, you <laughs> are glad that we're there. Mm -hmm. And whether it's fire, wa water, uh, floods, meth cleanup, mold cleanup, trauma cleanup, we do all of those services. Okay. so. Now, this is a business that you do on your own or you've got employees. Tell me the, the scope and the scale of, of this kind of business. Uh, right now, we have contracts with uh, the University of New Mexico, New Mexico Tech. Uh, our work is all around the state. Okay. Uh, we're right now at 16 full-time employees, 16 two part-time okay. employees. So, uh, you know, we are doing this interview in uh, September of, of 2012. There's been a recession going on. Unemployment is, uh, you know, very high, been stubbornly high. A lot of businesses have failed. Big banks have had bailouts. Tell me, what's going on in, in your business? We've actually been able to see a, a growth, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really the dedication of the employees, the management, and everybody involved to really get out there and, and try and do the best that we can for really our fellow neighbors, our customers. Okay. So give me an idea of the scale of the business that you're doing. Uh, you've been in business for how long? Uh, we've been in business 17 years. 17 years. Um, we are a multi-million dollar company. Mm -hmm. And as far as um, um, we, we can cover the whole state as mm -hmm. far as what we can do. Okay, so you're a, a seven-figure business. Yes, sir. Okay, and with 16 employees. You know, I know uh, of doctors and attorneys who aren't even making that kind of business. And if they are, they're definitely not netting very much. Right. So, and what's interesting about, about your type of business, it's when we talk about entrepreneurship and, and American business, a lot of it is geared towards the sexier kind of businesses, high tech, you know, social networking apps and that kind of thing. And you're, frankly, you're not in a business that's very sexy, but you're, you fit a profile that um, fits what was uh, featured in a book called The Millionaire Mind and The Millionaire Next Door. I don't know if you've ever read or heard of that mm -hmm. book. As a former sure stockbroker, uh, they, they did a profile on what does the average American uh, millionaire look like, what's the profile. And I, one of the things that struck me was that the average American millionaire uh, that's a business owner has what they call a mundane type of business. <laughs> right. You know, it's a, uh, a butcher shop, a uh, construction company, paving or something. So um, you fit that profile. We sure do. Like you said, there's nothing glamorous about putting on your boots and wading into sewage uh -huh. to start cleaning out an environmental mess or going into someone's home that's been burnt and with all their mementos and everything uh -huh. that have been damaged. But it really is a service that it's, I guess that's like we're talking about the entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. That's what's great about our business is it gives meaning to our job. Okay. We're actually going into people's lives that have been wrecked. Uh -huh. uh, they, they really don't want us there but they sure are glad that we're there to be able to help them out, help them through a time of need. So all of our employees are really happy to have, I'm not saying that a lot of people don't have jobs that have meaning, but ours really do. If, if right? you could get over that emotional uh -huh. deal, that it really is nice to be able to help out. Helping people in a time of need. Yes. Right. And so tell me, uh, what is your American dream? And, and what does it mean to you as an Hispanic American? I have to say my American dream, um, because I, I was thinking about that. How, how, how was I as influenced with my, my American dream? And it was really, I have a picture of my grandparents when they had their house that was paid for, and that was the American dream, and they accomplished it. And so that became my dream. To own a home. To own just own a home. And then once 
I accomplished that and made it into a rental and got another home, uh -huh. uh, I started saying that's how it's changed my influence because my American dream was exactly what my family had around me was to you know have have a house, have a car, right. and once I started growing bigger and bigger in the company, it really made me have to look and reach out to see. Uh, what I wanted to really so your American start dream has expanded. Then it sounds like yes, okay. it sure has, and right. it's nice. It's it's great to live in a country. I could say to live in a country that we can actually show a profit mm -hmm. by helping our our uh, fellow man. Uh huh. Okay. All right. So, uh, do you think an entrepreneur uh, mentality or personality is different from the average person? I mean, not everybody starts selling bubble gum. And, you know, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're great at, <laughs> That's at true. making a profit. That's true. And I think we have a, there's a photo of you uh, counting your coins, or right, or and how old were you in that in that photo? I was in third grade, so I must have been around eight, seven years old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I understand because you know I started selling paper airplanes when I was you know about six years old from Life Magazine. Yeah. You know, with the, with the na around the neighborhood. Actually, I got my my sister, my younger sister, and her friends to sell them door to door, and so. And, and that's a pattern with, with entrepreneurs. I think entrepreneurs are, are born, not made. I mean, you can become an entrepreneur later on, but I think there's usually signs early. Right. Uh, I think Bill Gates was selling, uh, I think it was cards, uh, baseball cards or, or football cards, some kind of trading cards, you know, when he was young. So uh, what else did you do growing up that showed your entrepreneurial spirit? Um, I, I became president of uh, New Mexico for the DECA Association when uh -huh. I was in high school. Okay. And um, DECA for our audience means what? Uh, it was, now, now that you put me on the spot, I can't remember exactly what it was. Is it a but business or organization? It's a, it's a business organization for high school students. Okay. And uh, I was New Mexico president f oh. uh, of that. And when we did that, we were able to get all the businesses uh, together for at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And we raised over $25,000 wow. for. This is uh, high school kids? This is high school kids. Okay. And we were able to raise it for uh, presents for the uh, homeless oh, okay. kids, and it was something that was really nice to do. What? How did you raise twenty-five thousand dollars? Actually, I started in. Uh, they had a Somos program. Mm -hmm. and Somos. It was called Somos at the time, and what it was for is they weren't having enough Latinos in college at the time uh -huh. when I was in high school, uh -huh. and so this program was through AT and T and I was picked out of the state to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And through that program, it allowed me to get to know a lot of corporate people. Okay. And so I just used that network to go around and tell them what I was trying to accomplish, and they all helped me so out. So they funded you, they sponsored? Yes. Funded you. So you raised 25000 on your own or for the organization? Uh, on my own. Wow. Uh, what, wasn't own. the organization supposed to help you out? Uh, the, actually, they <laughs> did by, by helping me with the network. I would okay. have never known the network if it wasn't for the organization. Okay, so you went straight to the source. You weren't like selling cupcakes or bake no. sales or lemonade, you just went. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So tell me about the, the business side of your business. Uh, so we know that you restore uh, buildings and homes that have been damaged for fire. So, but what, tell me about the business part of it. It's real, uh, it's real interesting business because it's something that you have to plan for, but it's hard to plan for disasters. Okay. Uh, you don't know when disasters are going to strike. You don't know when they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the key to our business and our planning is education. Edu if you're going to be sending employees that you care about and that they're trusting you, you don't want them to be wading through sewage and not understand what it takes to protect themselves, mm -hmm. uh, what it takes to protect the homeowners, and what it takes to protect people around them. Uh, so it starts off with the education of the employee. And then as far as marketing is concerned, um, it really takes time to understand how you're going to have a marketer go out and market you mm -hmm. to make sure that you important. have the, you know, you got to have the business in the first place, right? Right, right. right. Is so, there a lot of competition in, in this industry? Uh, there is, uh -huh. and there, and especially the larger the loss, you have out-of-state people coming in, is just like right? us. We'll head to Arizona okay. if the loss is big enough, uh -huh. and we're competition to those people there. And you bid? Too. Is it a bidding process? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So how do you market yourself? I mean, do you wait for an event to happen and then con who do you call? I <laughs> know uh, that's, actually, uh, that's actually a good point. What we do is uh, if you were a building uh, facility owner or manager, we'd come to you and say it's not if it happens but when it happens. Mm -hmm. if you're, when, you're, when your building suffers a loss, we'd just like you to keep us in mind. So you pre 
We do pre sell yourself. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. That's how we do okay. it. Okay. So as an Hispanic entrepreneur, uh, you know, part of our culture is, is family. It's a big, has a strong impact on it. And, you know, I talk about this a lot in my book, uh, Hispanic culture is faith, family, and frijoles. So tell me about your family background and tell me what role family plays in, in your business. Well, a huge role was Pops. Uh, my father, he, he had the entrepreneurial spirit too. And uh, so he started a trucking business when he was younger. Uh -huh. And we learned by his failures of, of what he did uh, to make mine successful. Okay. And what was so nice is that he came and around 12 years ago, 10 years ago, and started helping me in the business once he retired. Uh -huh. And that was a great asset to myself. And then as far as, as my mom, Mm -hmm. She's the whole reason I'm talking to you. She's one of my, my biggest promoters out promoter, there. Promoter, exactly. Yeah. Trying to let everybody know what her son does and uh -huh. who he is. Uh -huh. So what role does family play in, in your... Obviously, your father inspired you to become an entrepreneur, or do you think yeah. you would have become an entrepreneur anyway? It must have been in my blood, and my father sure helped me. Part of it. <laughs> yeah, he, he sure helped he me be a part it? of it. He, he sure did when I was younger. Okay. And... Uh, I really think that, that family helps you as far as just sitting some principles down. I remember my mom and dad telling me that there's two pains that we're going to have to live with. You get to choose them, but no one escapes them. And okay. one is the pain of self-discipline uh -huh. or the pain of regret. Wow. That, that's absolutely true. There's, there's two, you have two uh, paths in life. You, you have discipline or you have regret. Right. Right. So uh, tell me about your discipline. I mean, it, like, it does take discipline to, to run a business. I mean, it... You know, a lot of people start a business, and I think the stats are seven out of ten businesses fail within, within five years. That's, a, I think, an SBA stat. Yeah. And, you know, knowing a lot of the business, business that I work with, business owners tend to be, and entrepreneurs tend to be excited about the idea or the project or the work and neglect the discipline of the accounting, the finance, you know, the, the mundane kind of stuff. Just like exercise, you know, we, we to look good, to have a healthy body, we got to do the exercise and right. so forth. And not everybody likes to do that. So, right. so that was instilled, discipline was instilled with you early. So is that a success trait, do you think? I, I think so. And um, what, really, what form did that take early on? Uh, well, one, one of the things that like, like my father was doing, even with my bubblegum business, okay. I, I had this money that I had made. And I want to go out and spend it right away. Mm -hmm. And he was really the one who sat me down and said, you know, you should save some of it. Mm -hmm. You should invest a little bit towards your business that you're doing and just think it out. Try, uh -huh. try and play both avenues. And sure, surely <laughs> it worked out. I mean, at the time, I really didn't feel that he knew what he was talking about. Uh -huh. But as time went on and I started seeing my savings account grow over the, mm -hmm. over the time, it, it really made a nice impression on me. Great foundation. That we, we, we do today. And it's affected me in business today because most of all of our trucks, all of our supplies, all of our equipment is paid for today. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So you have actually a fleet of trucks. Yes. I think you've got how many trucks and vehicles do you have as part of your business? Uh, Fourteen. Fourteen. And yes. they're all paid? Yes. See, that's not the American way. American way is finance, right? You right. To leverage, right? Right. So um, how, did, what, how does that make business sense to actually have money in, in vehicles that depreciate? Is that... It, it, all, it all depends on, on, on the structure that we're looking at, but f as far as retained earnings for, for a corporation, mm -hmm. it sure helps on the retained earnings of the okay. side of the corporation, but as far as... Um, but I think it's great. I mean, to, to, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised to find a, a business like yours that has um, equipment you know, that, that's paid for. I mean, I'm <laughs> a little bit surprised. But <laughs> our, our accountant so, was too. <laughs> really? So you could suffer any really any kind of downturn more easily than somebody that's highly leveraged. Yes. I, I, I can't imagine trying to make uh, uh, 14 vehicles, $600 a month payments on those, and right. then still trying to make payroll. Uh -huh. And just, just to think about on the insurance side of things, what you pay for insurance, just imagine what I pay for workman's comp sure. when I'm sending our employees into damaged buildings, wow. molded buildings. Right. Our, our insurance is just outrageous. So it really is something that I had to think about and say, how am I going to be able to afford just the insurance to run this business and right. payroll, right. much less trying to just spend it out on trucks and vehicles? There's a quote, I forget, from some uh, industri <coughs> industrialist back in the 1900s, and uh, I think he was being a little bit facetious, but he says, you're not a man until you can make payroll. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. It, 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 it's really true, and you really don't know that... And today it applies for women as well, but... Right, yeah. right. Uh. 
and, and the thing that I, I've always said about payroll is it really does, it makes you see what the company really is worth. Is that right? It, if, when it comes down to having to make up that payroll every, every week, mm -hmm. you, you can say whatever you want to say. So is that your first priority in, in your finances to make payroll? It is. is it? it is. My employees, my employees, all of them mean a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I realize that our success is really due to their success. Mm -hmm. And if they feel... Uh, confident and comfortable in their job. You're secure, it's, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. Because I know that, that the, the business slogan is, is customer first. We say no, it's employee first. Is that right? Because the employee is taking care of the customer. Okay. And if we, if we as management make sure that our employee is taken care of, then our employee in turn will make sure our customer is taken care of. Excellent. So do you think your Hispanic values are going up Hispanic? extends to that because Hispanics, you know, I had an epiphany one time when I was, I, was, I had left New Mexico and I was living in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was at a, um, a cocktail party with a country club type of crowd and, and, you know, people ask you about your background and so forth and I was the only Hispanic in, in, the, uh, in the group and obviously they ask you, do you have a large family? You know, Hispanics have large families, right? Right, right. And it, my response was, sure, there's at least five or six dozen of us at least. Right. <laughs> and everybody kind of stopped and their, their mouths opened and their eyes widened. My girlfriend at the time, she was from Alabama, she came up and whispered behind my ear, said, she means your immediate family. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it may never occur to me that my family, so is, being an Hispanic, how does that um, influence the way you um, were deal with your employees? Um, I believe it's brought in a big family culture to, to uh -huh. our organization. Um, J just by having my father there and seeing the father and son mm -hmm. and us working together. And then it extends out because everyone knows about my mom. She's, she's always trying to drum up new business somehow, Is some right? way, <laughs> and, and bring it in. And she doesn't even Do work for the business. No, <laughs> that's the whole thing. She's not and, on a commission or retainer. Right, and, and it's the same with my father. He, uh -huh. He's doing it not, not for the paycheck, but he's right. actually, since he's retired, yeah. he's actually in the business just helping me out, yeah. which is really given, and to me, that really is the flair of family, that they're there to, to really help, help out. You know, I'm finding that's the case with a lot of Hispanic-owned businesses, is the fam it's the network of the extended family that really helps, and a lot of time they're not on the payroll, and they don't necessarily care to be on the payroll, but it's that resource and that foundational, even if it's emotional support, right. that means so much in, in you know, helping you succeed as a, a, a business owner. So we talked about family. Let's talk about uh, the challenges of being an entrepreneur. I mean, you obviously started early, and you had some great mentoring. You, you the father telling you about the importance of saving and reinvesting, and so you had a really great foundation. But what are the challenges just starting the business? You've been in business 17 years, right? Uh huh. Uh, the the number one challenge from when when um, I first started the business was no one wanted to hire a 23 year old general contractor. Uh huh. So I just wasn't getting business because I just looked young. Uh -huh. I looked like I was still in high school practically. Uh -huh. So what I had to do is go out and hire people that were 50 and older was what I said is my goal. Uh -huh. And with that, I balanced that out. And then well, how did you hire them if you didn't have the business in the first place? Did you pull money out of savings? Yes. I mean, was it a chicken and egg thing? Uh, tell me. Yes. What, what, what it was is it was just a lot of savings. And... I had that money saved. A lot of bubble gum sales. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my, my bubble gum paid off. Uh, and, and really that savings came into play, and that's how I paid for them. And these people that I was hiring at the time, I just made it work. I, it seems like I starved and, and until the business could get going, and then sorry. once it did, So they I got the sales in. Right. Okay. I, I can totally relate to that because I started off my career as a stockbroker the junior year of, of college. And so, you know, I was 23 years old, and like you, I had to convince, you know, the only people that have money really is, is you know, seniors, you know, the retirement and savings. And uh, my business really took off is when I hired one of my, my uh, clients. Uh, she was an elderly lady, retired, and she's probably in the late 60s. And what I would do is I would bring her into the office, and when I was talking to a couple, a retired couple, I would just have her sit next, next to them, pretend she was taking notes. And I told her, whenever I say something, just smile and nod. <laughs> you know, because, you know, starting young, you know, and a lot of entrepreneurs, they start young. I mean, they start, mm -hmm. you know, age is not a factor for us, but it's, right. but, you know, appearances and uh, customers comfortable with, you know, com uh, level of comfort 
is right. an impact. So it's interesting how you got over that, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, hire and, somebody more comfortable. And then the next thing that was faced was, I always remember telling uh, my friends at the time and my family, as long as this company makes $50,000, I'm set for life. As long as it makes $50,000 a year, I'm great. So I had a goal of where I was going, and once I attained it, mm -hmm. that became a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here, and how do we know we got there? So you're, what I'm hearing is it's your own limitations was a exactly. challenge. Exactly. So 50000 was a, a top benchmark at that time. It was. Uh -huh. and, and so I guess one of the best things to, to do when, when you're in business is to really educate yourself in, in the business you're in and the expectations of others. And it really helps you to set some, some good benchmarks, which has really helped me. Okay. Are, there, are, there, are there benchmarks besides financial benchmarks? Yeah, I, quality of life, I would say, is a huge benchmark. Oh, tell me about that. It, it's like with my father. Uh, he's in our business, and he's put a lot of time into it. Mm -hmm. And now he's starting to, we're trying to help him out to where he can enjoy his retirement. Mm -hmm. And same with, like, me. I'm trying to get it to where I'm not always in the business uh, How many hours a week do you generally work? Uh, between 60 to 70. 60 to 70 hours. And yeah. are, they, are they always at the office or do you work from home sometimes? No, they're always in the office. Always, so you separate your personal life and your work life? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, so the quality of life is really important and having time to, to spend with family is, is, is big. Do you take vacations or take breaks? Uh, <laughs> that's one thing that I'm trying to work on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Well, you're in, a, you're in an industry, in a, in a business where you can't always predict you know, what, what's going on. So if there's an event and there's, uh, you know, contracts or employees that have to be out, you know, you, you have to be there. Right. Right. So do you love your work? I do. Okay. I, I actually do. And that, that's what I would say to anyone going into business uh -huh. is make sure you love it. But then the second biggest thing, too, is make sure you can show a profit. Uh -huh. It's a great thing to have a love, but you don't love it anymore when you're broke. True. And so th it's a real balancing act between, and I was fortunate enough to find a, a business that I loved and was able to show a profit in. Mm -hmm. And did you stumble upon this or how did you, did, did, I mean, nobody, grew, I, I don't think people grew up saying, I love cleaning up Best disasters. <laughs> right. You know, so I stumbled into it actually in Santa Fe. Uh, we were at the time general contracting and we were doing painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got us to go in and paint in after a, a fire. And so uh, as I got to see their operation, it's one of those things entrepreneurs have in them. Uh, I just looked at it and said, I could do this better. Is that right? I, I, I could really, I really could You just make saw this. the business. The right. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs have a vision. They start with maybe they experience something they hadn't experienced before and they see a light bulb go off mm -hmm. or they just have an inkling uh, about a business. Uh, so was there an epiphany moment where you said, where you said I can do, you know, you said I could do this better, but was that, would you say that's an epiphany? I would, okay. I would, because I, I, I just didn't think it, I felt it. I mean, okay. I was really, it was a burning in, in, in my gut that I said, I know I can do this a lot better uh -huh. than what I'm seeing being done. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went after it and it, and there's a knowing, you know, again, uh, we talked about the distinction between an entrepreneur and someone that works for a corporation or business or state. And a large part of success, if you study successful business owners, entrepreneurs, especially innovators, they always talk about their gut. I had a gut feeling. I had it, it's a gut feeling or an intuition or knowing. For me, a lot of times it's I know and I know something. Right. And sometimes there's no evidence to support it. So right. you, what I'm hearing you say is you had a gut feeling? Yes. <laughs> it was, it was, you followed it, your instincts. Right, exactly. Okay. And, and saw that there could be a good profit to be made when I was just doing my own research on, on what I had saw go on. Okay, so you did research on the industry before? Yes. Okay, so where, what areas of, uh, how big is the business? You're doing, you said, not just New Mexico, you're in uh, several states now? We, we, we do, right now, we are in uh, New Mexico and a portion of Arizona. Mm -hmm. We do work out in uh, Fort Defiance, Arizona, and, and all of New Mexico. Okay, and do you have plans to expand the business, or...? You, are you happy with where you're at now? And we, would, we would love to go into uh, three more different states. and we would they, like Is that because these states have more disasters than you other got states? It. Really? They, yes. Well, they have more that. hurricanes, oh, okay. tornadoes, and they suffer greater, larger losses. So we're trying to get ourselves financially fit enough to go out and uh, go out to those states, and that's our five-year goal.
Okay, so you have uh, five-year goals. Do you have long-term goals as well? We have a 10-year uh, business plan. Wow. So tell me what role does goal setting play in, in your business and your success? What I've noticed is as an organization gets bigger, it's a lot easier when it's just you and, say, two other people. Mm -hmm. You can change, and you're, 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 you're more of like that little jet that can fly around. And as you get bigger, you become like that big Boeing. Okay. And, and in order for goals... In order for employees to buy into what you're doing, they have to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And even though we might think just for ourselves that we know where we're going, they don't. Mm -hmm. And so goals are a huge thing for me so that from the managers all the way down to, to your uh, line staff mm -hmm. is that they know what this organization is trying to accomplish. So that if there's training that they want to do to become a manager, they can do it. Okay. Whatever they want to do just to help the organization. Okay. So that's, that's a goal setting that is very important. So... Now, we talked earlier about you're wanting to improve quality of life and take more time for yourself, and yet we're talking about expanding. So is there, a, is there a challenge there between the growth of the business and the quality of life, or how do you mesh that? Because that's a challenge a lot of entrepreneurs face. We tend to work a lot of hours, the labor of love, of course. Uh, but so how, how are you going to deal with that challenge? By educating some of the members of our staff that's been with us so you're going to delegate. While. We're going to start <laughs> delegating a lot more. Is that yes. easy to do? No. <laughs> it isn't. It really isn't. I had a, I had a thought, I feel you were going to say that. So it, it, It's almost like it's your baby. You started uh -huh. with it, yep. and now that it's walking, and now that you see it's running, for some reason it's still hard to, <laughs> to say, here, someone, someone can do it. It's uh -huh. not that you don't think they can do as good a job as you. Uh -huh. You just don't think they'll care about it as much as uh -huh. you. And so... I'm starting to realize, though, that there so, are great people out there that, that help and do care as much as I do about it. Okay. And so what's your long-term goal? Do you want to cash out of this business or you want to leave it to a family member? What's, what's your long-term goal as an entrepreneur? Because sometimes a lot of entrepreneurs have different visions. You know, right. they get up, and entrepreneurs tend to get bored with the business once it's up and running. You know, they've done it. They, they've proven that they can do it, and they always have a new idea. So what's, what's in the future for uh, Michael Reese. I would love to have this business for 25 more years is my okay. plan uh -huh. and to have some type of buyout plan uh, to one of the employees okay. and uh, I'm hoping that one of the employees from here till now will step up and want to be an owner of this business mm -hmm. and to start Are they a aware of that, uh, that opportunity now? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, how do you communicate that to, to them? Uh, I just let them know that you have to be educated in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be suicide for me to hand over a business sure, to absolutely. someone that doesn't understand what's going on and that they have to really understand and show to me now that they have an interest in some way for them to save to be able to buy it. Okay. And so in the minute that we have left, uh, tell me what advice would you give to anybody an entrepreneur out there, whether it be a young kid who's selling whatever is selling, <laughs> like you did, or someone who really has that gut feeling that they want to get into a business, what advice would you give them? I would tell them, number one is education, whatever education. it is. Education, get out there and understand your business. So you don't mean just a formal education, like reading and writing and arithmetic. You mean right. edu educating yourself about the industry that you're in. Exactly. Uh -huh. Get out in the trenches, okay. see if it's really something you love, mm -hmm. and then after that, like I said, always make sure you can show a profit. That's huge. Okay. Return on investment. You can't have a business. You, you can be great at whatever, but uh -huh. as long as there's no return on investment, you'll be shutting your doors tomorrow. Okay. There's a, a quote from, a, I think it was a book probably in the 80s came out. It says, do what you love and the money will follow. And I always thought that was kind of a, yeah, you do have to do what you love, but the money doesn't always follow. So I, right. I, one of my books I wrote, if, you, if you're doing what you love and the money's not following, chances are you didn't create a business plan first. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, Correct. I agree with you. All right. Well, Michael, thank you for, for sharing your story. It's very inspiring, and I um, wish you best of luck with, with the business. It sounds like you've, you've been doing great, and we wish you much success in the future. Okay. Thank you. And I want to thank our, our audience for joining us on American Dream Latin Souls. Make sure you visit us on the web at latinosuccess.com.